Uh, but I just want to start um, this this um, last session will really be focused on the technology and the platforms for the ITB2 uh, Transmark um, uh, Foundation. Uh, so we will give you an overview of the community technology, sort of where we're going at a more strategic level, and then uh, dive into the more immediate roadmaps for ITB2 and Transmark. And uh, I think we'll have plenty of time for open discussion. We definitely want to hear from you. Um, we want to hear what you think about our roadmap, where we're going, and where you think we should go. So I will um, ask Griffin to, to jump in and Hi, thank you, Diane. Uh, it's pretty incredible that I think we still have over 100 people still on this call here so late in the day where we probably lost a bunch um, just from Europe because it, um, uh, it's uh, late at this point. So thank you for sticking in there. Um, Griffin Weber, I've spoken a couple of times earlier today I'm from Zakahani's informatics department at Harvard Medical School. I'm on the board of directors of the ITBT Transmart Foundation, and I chair this committee on technology as well as the user interface working group, which I'll be running a session on tomorrow. We formed this committee a little over a year ago with a few goals. One is to create an inventory of foundation products, things like software, plugins, ETL, et cetera. We have lots of different groups scattered all over the world developing uh, uh, different components that are compatible with our software. And it's hard to even keep track of what that is and which things work with each other. So there's one thing, just sort of a discovery component. Understanding what products are compatible with each other, what dependencies exist, and what common technologies we can leverage. Addressing technology issues that might affect multiple products, such as the data models we're using, APIs, authentication, security, and deployment. And importantly, looking at ways of uh, bundling compatible products to address common use cases. You've heard this a few times today, but I'm going to go into a little bit more depth um, why these bundles are important and uh, where th that idea may go in the future. This working group is uh, open to everyone, uh, though our audience is really focused on developers of software programs that are intended to be compatible with the different platform products that we uh, manage through this foundation. Also, if you have different products that you're combining in interesting ways, that's also uh, of interest to us. Again, our, our, our foundation has developed uh, all dozens of different programs and tools over the years, uh, I2B2 and Transmart being the, uh, the main core applications. I2B2 is really focused on a common data model, application layers, and APIs whereas Transmart really extended it with a suite of exploration, visualization, and ETL tools. Other things that have been built for ITB to include different user interfaces and query tools. Uh, you heard from Paul all the amazing things they're doing with uh, a RESTful API data store and interface with picture, as well as uh, ferry networks do things like try and act, where you'll learn much more about tomorrow afternoon. There's been ontologies that develop data sets for ITB2 and Transmart and various ETL processes. So how do we ensure that these are all going to work together and uh, we can use them for different use cases? So the first thing is adopting a common data model. We've been working on this for about a year, but it's been greatly accelerated through our grant from Dell Technologies. Uh, we're going to be Moving forward, using the ITB21.7.12 star schema, the core set of tables. An important part of this, though, is documenting what are the uses for the different fields in these tables. Um, it's a very generic data model, can be used for a lot of different things. And even though we're using the same tables and fields, ITB2 and Transmart and other programs have repurposed in a way the fields for different things over, over time. So uh, making sure everyone agrees to how to use these fields and tables is going to be just as important as us um, agreeing to what the schema specifically is. Uh, we mentioned earlier today about creating two different bundles for our Dell grant. The first is a federated query bundle that combines ITB2, the Act Ontology, and Shrine so that you can, uh, you can set up multi-site queries searching for COVID patients or other uh, query use cases. The other is a genomic analysis bundle that combines ITB2 but with clinical data as well as genomic data 
and different analysis tools like Transmark Picture or things like Jupyter Notebooks. The idea of a bundle is that it combines foundation-related tools, ontology, and different kinds of data. Uh, a key to the bundles is that they're well documented. We're describing what the use cases are. We have clear architecture diagrams. We even point to publications that have been written from institutions that have similar kinds of setups. So today you can kind of go into different places. You can download ITB to, from one source, go to a different place and get Shrine, or another place and get the ontologies. Um, and there's different documentation for each one. So you have to kind of hunt around for everything. Here's going to be very clear within a bundle where if you want to be able to do federated queries, here's what the overall picture looks like, all the different components that you have to get and install. The documentation will contain all the system requirements you need and all the components in one location. We'll have step-by-step -step install instructions. It doesn't mean there's going to be one install guide, but there may be one Uber guide that points you to the different things you have to read and follow to, to that install. Similarly, we're going to try as much as possible to have consolidated configuration options. So you can update one file as opposed to having many separate files for different uh, components. We've been thinking a lot about what kinds of bundles we might want to have in the future. Here are just some ideas. Um, we'd love for people to join our committee and try to come up with additional types of bundles we may think about and help us figure out how we want to actually implement these and what the use cases that we want to um, promote these are for. So one might just simply be an extended EHR bundle. I2B2 is typically used within hospitals. You load your EHR data into there. Uh, there's typically the coded data uh, uh, diagnoses, laboratory tests, medications, um, various sites do different tools that have been built for I2B2. We'll parse clinical notes and load those into I2B2. There's a program called My2B2, which connected images to I2B2, and various machine learning algorithms that run phenotyping algorithms um, and load those into I2B2. So we can pick up a whole suite of plugins and extensions that can enrich your EHR data with other uh, information that you have at your institution. Um, there's a clinical trial bundle you can envision that combines ITB2 from the Transmart tools and REDCap. ITB2 REDCap synchronization is a, a, a common thing that sites are either doing today or would like to do at some point in the future. So Paul uh, gives some great examples of what you can do with a picture platform. And there's been a number of different in user interfaces created for ITB2, something called LEAF, the Shrine user interface, uh, we'll see tomorrow, and the uh, picture. UI. Uh, again, we'll go. We'll talk more about these tomorrow in the user interface working group. You can imagine a bundle that allows users to switch between these different UIs depending on the type of user they are or the kind of functionality that they want. The vision for the future over the next two or five years. What are we looking at? So with ITB2 and Transmark, we've been successful over the last decade at providing researchers with tools to query and analyze patient data, but as we know, we've talked about a lot today with all the messy 4C heat data, uh, COVID data, their raw clinical data are often biased and incomplete. There's quality problems, and this can result in misleading and incorrect findings. So for a vision for the future is how do we develop technologies and methods that will extract what we call kind of the truth from clinical data to create a learning health system. So there's a set of kind of raw data about patients that are in the EHRs, but what you really want to know is what's the real clinical state of the patient, what are they at risk for, how do you infer all this information that you really want from the raw data that's there? So learning from the data, finding the truth in clinical records, being able to go from coded data to actual phenotypes, being able to estimate, severe, to estimate disease severity and do predictions like genomic risk scores, which may be a little bit less biased than what a physician wrote in a clinical note. But what do we want to learn from the data? Be able to find trajectories of similar patients to a patient physician is seeing, develop targeted treatments, precision medicine applications, pharmacovigilance applications looking for adverse drug effects, and population trends such as uh, disease outbreaks, which is on everyone's mind right now, and public health applications. So in order to get there, we need access to high quality data and large patient populations. And that's a lot of what our tools have been are getting us today. But in order to kind of go to the next step, we need some better tools for assessing data quality and handling data quality issues like missing data. 
methods to extracting information from new sources of data, notes, wearable technology, genomic data, and environment. Methods of creating derived facts, such as natural language processing, rule-based algorithms, inference, and artificial intelligence, and using explainable AI and machine learning um, to, to better uh, characterize our patient populations. So specifically, where are we going? We've, uh, we've uh, mentioned before we came to this common star scheme of data model that will help us integrate our various tools. Another important part is a patient set data model that allows you to integrate patient information from different sources and pass your data from module to module within a workflow. And then simpler kind of things like single sign-on technology between analytic tools allow us to toggle back and forth between all the different uh, programs that have been developed by our community. I'm going to stop there, and then we're going to switch over to some product-specific roadmaps. All right, so I'm going to take most of this, and Sean will jump in. I'm, I'm Jeff Klan. I'm for the last year or so, I've been serving as the director of ITB2 core platform development. I'm an assistant professor in Sean's group, and I've been working with ITB2 for about seven years now. Um, Sean, who will also speak, is the creator of ITB2 and the brains behind all of this. Uh, so Griffin, Griffin talked a bit about the five-year vision, kind of the five, the two to two to seven-year vision, maybe of extracting truth from clinical data and creating a learning health system. I'm going to speak much more narrowly for the next ten minutes or so on a shorter-term plan, which is just what we're doing with the I2B2 core platform, and that is increasing the usability of the core software and increasing. Uh, your involvement as a community in uh, in the software development. So the two overall things I want to talk about are one is engagement. We want you guys to be involved in developing core features and participating in in the uh, in the process of development. And the second thing is what we're doing with the core software. We just had uh, 1.7.12a released in May, and I'll talk about the features we're adding there and the things that we're going to be doing in 13, which is coming out around the end of the year. So in terms of engaging developers, engaging people to participate in this project, uh, about two years ago, ITB2 switched to the Mozilla public license, which is a standard open source license. ITB2 has always been open source, but now it's a standard license that's easily understandable by legal teams. And so it, what it means to participate is much more, um, much more easy to, to grasp. Um, we have been using GitHub for a few years, so all of our development is open. You can see pushes on the main branch every few days. You can always pull down the, the latest changes if you want to be a, you know, a pre-alpha tester. That's always available. We have, have had a JIRA for a number of years where we do issue tracking. Uh, recently, we made that viewing that JIRA public. So anyone, uh, which is in line with other open source projects, other large scale open source projects. So anyone can log in and see what's, what's happening on the JIRA. We also um, engaged uh, community beta testers for the last round to help us, um, help us participate, uh, to, to help people participate in getting our software uh, bug free. And we're also trying to make available information on uh, things that we're planning in the short term. So release notes for future releases. This, this shows when we were planning 12, we had release notes ahead of time on uh, what we were planning to put in. And one result of all of this uh, increased desire to have openness is that we had a record number of community contributed features in the last I2B2 release that recently came out. Um, a lot of these are, are fairly small things. Um, some of them are bigger, but it does highlight that we're really trying to engage people and asking people to uh, help us put things in ITB2. In fact, a number of the features that ended up in 12 uh, came out of th this conference last year. Um, we had conversations with people. Uh, I talked to a couple of people about specific changes that they'd made to the web client or things that they'd found useful that they'd tweaked in the core software. And we managed most of these community contributed features were inspired by, by last year's conference. Um, so other things that we're doing, we're, we're trying to improve the documentation of I2B2. There's so much to I2B2 and it's been developed over 10 years and it's a vast amount of documentation that needs to kind of be um, 
kind of pushed into a smaller package that's easier to understand. So the first step in that was uh, about a year ago, the community wiki was completely revamped. It's much easier to navigate now. It's the home for everything I2B2. It's not just community projects. It's also the core software and the core documentation. Um, we, we have new web client documentation that the team put a lot of effort into. It's, it's really much clearer now. It includes things like screencasts and overviews and goal-oriented teaching. It, it's much easier to understand. Um, another documentation piece that Griffin has talked about a couple of times is for this uh, project that, that Dell is funding. We are uh, developing new documentation of the I2B2 common data model, which is the I2B2 um, 1.7.12 data model. We're putting all the pieces together um, <clears throat> for a better documentation. Uh, and, and so those are kind of all the pieces we're doing to engage the community. Now I wanna talk about the core software for, for the, the bulk of this presentation, because I know that's, that's definitely of interest to a lot of people. So we had 12, ITB2 1.7.12 come out in January. It was probably the largest number of new features in a new release in a while. We put a lot of effort into adding a lot of new features. Um, 12A just came out last month. It fixed some critical bug fixes. So everyone should be using 12A if they're on a new version of I2B2. They should not be using 12. So be sure you, you don't go to 12, you go to 12A. And then 13 is a little bit of a slimmer release. It has not as many big new things, but it kind of continues our commitment to maintain and enhance the core software with new features. So uh, I'm gonna go over what's in 12 uh, quickly. I take spend a couple minutes on this. Um, we vastly revamped the install process. So now installing the uh, Wildfly server is really, really easy. You can build it from source in like two steps, from source to deployment. You can install it from a WAR file in one step uh, and we distribute a pre-compiled WAR file. So there's a lot of enhancements there. Um, I2B2 has had the ability to count the number of um, patients associated with each uh, concept in the ontology for a long time in the sense that it's been part of the data model and it's been part of the web client user interface, but there has not been um, really a standard way of counting um, to fill in these you know, millions of ontology rows with, uh, with counts. And so we, uh, I mean, this, these counting scripts actually have a long history. Griffin and Lori and the Arch network and the ACT network now and just, they keep they keep going, but now we've got these concept counting scripts in the I2B2 core release, uh, and they're they're going to be enhanced a lot on 13 to be even you know, faster and more robust. Um, an, another really big thing was adding Redcap import, so you can now link I2B2 um, live to a Redcap project, a Redcap survey, and a Redcap will automatically update I2B2. Um, or rather I2B2 will automatically update when REDCap, when a survey is submitted by a user. So you've got this kind of live stream of REDCap data that can flow into I2B2 and uh, I2B2 will create an ontology based on the, on the REDCap survey form. So that was, that was a huge change too. Um, and then uh, the final, I think the final thing is we completely rewrote the fine terms interface. And I have a lot of slides on this because this is like my personal um, project, but I'm gonna just kind of skim through it very quickly since we don't have a lot of time. Um, but it used to be in everything previous to 12 that when you did a fine terms in I2B2, you have this beautiful hierarchy with all of this nuance and like, and everything in folders and you do a fine terms it just pops up as a flat list. So you search for gout, you get like a list of different types of gout, but you don't know what's in what folder or how it's all arranged in ontology. There are some folders that pop up, but there's also things within that folder that pop up. So the first thing I did was to get rid of the duplicate terms. So the top five or six things don't show up in the second half of the slide because they're already contained in the gout folder. So it, it just chops those out of the search results. That incidentally allows us to do much bigger searches on I2B2. So now it's very hard to find a real term that you're searching for that goes over the initial uh, search limit of, of a thousand terms. So it makes, it makes searching a lot faster and just in terms of uh, server responsiveness. Um, but then at conversations that we had here at this conference last year, and then um, some, some work that uh, the ACT network was doing uh, caused us to kind of redo this again uh, based on an interface developed uh, at UW called LEAF, 
that it just shows the actual hierarchy when you search for the for search for a term. So instead of seeing um, you know things in kind of a, a flat list or a pseudo hierarchy, you actually see where they fit in the hierarchy. But it's truncated, so you don't see like. For example, on diagnoses, gout is under metabolic and immunity disorders, but you don't see all the other metabolic and immunity disorders. It just shows gout. So you can get kind of the picture of where all these things fit in the hierarchy without the clutter of seeing the entire, uh, the entire tree, which is, seems, to be, seems to be something that people really like. Um, and then at this meeting last year, people said, but sometimes I do want to see the whole tree. Sometimes I want to see where everything fits. And it... it Turns out that we had a feature that we were able to port back into I2B2 from some internal work at partners where you can find uh, the term in the tree and it'll pop up and uh, go back to the navigate terms window and show you exactly where a term falls in the uh, hierarchy. Um, okay. Wow, I talked about that for a long time. <laughs> All right. So, community contributed features. We took the ACT ontology, which We've talked about it earlier today, and we'll talk about more tomorrow. The ACT ontology is huge, it, both in terms of number of terms, but also in terms of impact. It's really quite an amazing feat, and now we have a version of that in the core release. Um, Beth Israel contributed some easier to read counts. Um, UNC contributed some the ability to have extended flags in query by value. Um, Pavia uh, contributed again, just some, some tweaks on how counts show up, which has been helpful since this release had a lot of count stuff in it. And then the design of the fine terms interface, which came from uh, UW. Uh, not on this slide, we also, um, the counting script for Postgres also was contributed by a developer at WashU. <clears throat> um, and then additionally, we made some UI tweaks and we added some authentication methods. And I won't stay on those. 12a, we made some major bug fixes. They're not very interesting on a slide, but they're really important. So make sure you get 12a. We fixed some things with queuing. We fixed some things with the new fine terms interface. Red cap import wasn't working on Postgres, and we improved overall performance on the counting scripts. Um, so in 13, this is the kind of the short list of things that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're making some more user interface tweaks, mostly to increase the visibility of some of these really great features that people don't even know are there. So uh, a surprising number of people don't know there's a temporal query tool in the I2B2 web client, which makes possible to do really complex queries. And so we're going to put that on a tab. The same with the timeline view that a lot of people aren't um, familiar with but it's a very powerful feature. Um, and we're also gonna put in a CSV table export, which uh, the ACT group at Mass General Brigham developed to help you develop these kind of big flat tables in order to uh, do deeper analysis on your data. So, and this lets you kind of interactively develop such a table. So we'll have this new CSV export plugin in 13. Um, also revamping the total num counting scripts. So they're faster, more stable. They're going to produce a report, an obfuscated report that people can just export. They'll have the same obfuscation as Shrine. Um, and then there's also going to be a tracking table that counts the number of, um, counts the number of facts, uh, patients per, per concept over time. So you can track it over, over many refreshes. And that'll allow you to do analytics. The analytics tools will not be directly part of 13, but they will be available to ITB, the I2B2 community. Um, and then uh, we're working on putting Cynthia data into I2B2. So Cynthia is a MITRE project to create synthetic data based on kind of a model. So it's not, it's not based on real data. It's based on um, a model of how patient disease courses work, uh, which I think was developed from real data, but it comes from this, this, uh, uh, this, these complex flow charts uh, and, prob and probabilities, so kind of like Bayesian networks. And that uh, has been used to develop a Massachusetts data set that mimics kind of the statistical characteristics of the Massachusetts population on these Cynthia data. And so that's going to be put into, so that that's not in I2B2 format, so we're converting that to I2B2 format and going to put that in the core release. And we're also going to improve the database upgrade and possibly install process. In the last release, we vastly improved the core software install. And so next release, we're tackling the database install, which 
um, we'll have some improvements too. And then other things that are happening that are not part of what you know, Mike and Sean and Rita and I are doing, but things that are happening in the I2B2 community that's going to play into what's in 13 are these bundles that Griffin was talking about a couple minutes ago. And um, then I hope there will be more in 13. I hope that you will contribute stuff. Um, I hope that you'll develop a new feature. And you can submit a GitHub pull request. Uh, you'll have to fill out a developer certificate of origin for our to, to cover our butts so that we know that you're actually able to submit that feature as an open source feature. And, um, and then you can just drop us a line that you've done that. And we would be excited to put that into the release. You can also chat with us about what would be good. And, and we'd, we'd love to work with you on things like that. We, I'd also like to clean up the community projects page. So there's a lot of projects that haven't been touched in a long time. And there's a lot of stuff that's active that's not on that page. Um, and we're definitely working to improve the documentation and we'd love help with that too. Um, so what's beyond 13? Um, we're starting to think about uh, bundles for clinical research engagement. And this draws from some of the stuff that Sean and I talked about earlier in the day. And um, I think I'll, I'll let Sean chime in here because- yeah, before you move on, there's a couple of questions you want to quickly just oh, maybe. I don't, I don't have a, a window open that tells me the well, question. So, so I can read yeah. to you. Uh, uh -huh. Jim Campbell's asking um, for the fact counting software. Uh, the, the, he assumes it's aggregating on concept CD um, because oh, yeah. some of the I2B2 facts vary context. Um, and the fact count can be restricted by the modifier CD. You know what he's talking about? I not having it in front of me. So it does okay. aggregate on the concept CD. It, okay. it does not, we haven't tackled counting modifier codes yet. Is that the, is, is that the question? Maybe I should. I, I think so. Pull up the, yeah. There's a Q and A window. Um, oh, this is in the Q and A window. Okay. okay. Yeah. I have yes. That. He always said yes. <laughs> that was... Okay. Okay. Yeah. We haven't yeah. tackled counting modifiers yet, but. Okay but we will do that at some point. Um, what are the other questions? Um, Marshall Ruffin is asking, I saw a patient with transli transitional carcinoma of the ureter recently. I could not find the concept in the oncology. Um, so it's for transitional cell is not there for uh, carcinoma in the ureter. I don't know. Okay, that so that, specific. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so that's not right. a, that doesn't sound like a question on the, right. on exactly. the like I2B2 core platform, which, exactly. um, you know, I mean, it, it could point to a bug and, and find terms because mm -hmm. we have fixed a bunch of those with, with things yeah. not showing up when you type in multiple words that that, that got fixed recently. But I okay. think this is about the ontology. And so that's not, that sounds like. that's probably not something that I am qualified to answer. Okay. Well, so we try to hit it. And then I, oh, I2B2 workbench. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the I2B2 workbench, and you know, Sean has a vision beyond this. He can chime in. But the, the I2B2 workbench is not presently part of the core software that we're maintaining. So there is a version of the workbench that works. And we try to test it in every release and make sure it still works. Mm -hmm. But we're not adding to it at this point. And it's not to say that it's dead forever, but just right now we're not. Sean. Okay. So, yeah, let's move on. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, a couple of things. The workbench, the, the, the reason that the workbench is important is because it's a potential for doing a lot of batch processing. So you can see in front of you kind of a roadmap for the future in terms of how to go about clinical research and supporting clinical research through a series of applications. The applications actually include very prominently I2B2 and its way of dealing with level one facts, but then there's also Transmart, which actually is ideal for dealing with level two facts. So those two bundled together is actually incredibly important to the future of uh, the I2B2 Transmart community. And then further supporting you know, local analytics and heart validation as David Hanauer uh, uh, presented. So you can see it, it's really important to fit all these together in order to achieve this, uh, this bundle, if you want to call it that, but more uh, a roadmap for being able to support actual, you know, research from end to end, right? From 
understanding the problem to publication um, in, in the uh, I2B2 network. And so this is you know, where we really think that uh, the future lies. Um, it was really played out in this COVID uh, uh, crisis, uh, came together uh, in a fairly manual way, and now the idea is sustaining it, right? So how do we sustain it and, and build it so that um, you know, a lot of the, the issues that Ricardo, for example, was, ta was talking about uh, that came up in the Italian uh, hospitals who kind of only partially implemented I2B2 and you know, others where we really wanna make it more ready, a more ready bundle, um, uh, possibly working with some outside uh, entities and so forth to really get that together so we can all have that available at our uh, hospitals and use it you know, on demand. So that's our roadmap. Shun, did you want to say anything else about the bundle for clinical research engagement? I mean, only that uh, perhaps, you know, it's a thin veil for the learning healthcare system, which, um, you know, is where, um, you know, in many ways, getting this kind of uh, into clinical care is, 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 is an even further reaching, but, but I think extremely attainable goal in that getting truthful data into, into clinical care is where we need to be when we do digital interventions and things that uh, Ken was talking about. So thank you. All right. So that's, that's us. Thanks. Um, there are three more I2B2 questions real quick. Maybe you guys can answer. Um, uh, have you considered uh, sorting the total num from high to low? Dan, Connelly? I, strange, I don't see these questions. Um, so, sorting the total num from high to low in what context? It's, it, the reports you can do many things with. And one interesting thing would be to look at where you have the most data, I suppose. Um, are you thinking of you in the web client that lets you browse from that, that perspective or an analytic engine that's based on yeah. Uh, largest number of counts. I don't, I don't quite know what the question is. Search um, results. <clears throat> oh, search results. Oh, so returning fine oh, terms. Yeah. Returning fine terms based on the, yeah, you know, I think this, this idea, I remember a conversation about doing something with that. Um, I'm, since we're running late, I'm going to just think about it for a minute and uh, okay. I'll drop you a note. Yep. Um, but let's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good idea. Definitely something that we've been thinking about. Um, there's also a question about the project request plugin. Uh, what is it still available and still supported? Yeah, so that was something that um, Mike spearheaded a couple of years ago, and I think it's still available. We haven't worked on it. Um, Sean, did you have thoughts on that? The figure like about to say something. Yeah, sure. I mean, in some ways, that's often the beginning of of of, of one of these clinical trial workflows. Sure. Uh, I think we actually do have it incorporated, but the, um, but the but putting it into the entire workflow of you know what we were looking at beginning to end, I think is something that would give it meaning. Yeah. Okay. Last question, real quick, was any news on SAML authentication? Mm, yeah, we have we have not uh, pursued no, SAML sorry, authentication yeah. further, but uh, okay. I, I think it was nice. this meeting last year someone said they had worked on it themselves so if you're if you're that person then get in touch because we would love to put that in okay cool okay so are you guys done thanks we'll switch uh, looks like there's one more question okay any yeah. work any plan work? yeah yeah any work on planned language? on language localization support so I, I actually think Mike is working on that. Mike Benders. Okay. Am I good? Okay, super. So uh, thank you. Um, I am the PMC lead for the Transmart project. Uh, Peter Rice uh, is the release manager from Axiomatics uh, and has done the, the bulk of the work that we're going to talk about uh, for the, the current release. 
Um, <clears throat> the uh, the PMC, you can see here the uh, the current participants uh, on the PMC. Uh, this is open. If anybody is, is interested in development uh, of Transmart, uh, you're certainly welcome to join. Um, our, our minutes are all published on the website. I can provide links for that. <clears throat> and if you'd like to participate, we do meet once a month. Um, uh, and um, the, basically the, the, pro the, the work of the PMC is to help guide where the, the platform is going uh, and um, make sure that you know, what we're doing uh, is, uh, is good quality and uh, ready for release, things like that. Uh, so if you have any interest, uh, you can talk to me uh, about it. Um, <clears throat> Transmart 19 has been a, a long time in coming. Uh, we certainly had a number of, of issues and things that we've been trying to sort out. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, technology uh, issues that we've been trying to work through. Uh, but we finally got the beta out in April and the full release uh, for Postgres uh, is now available. Uh, and Oracle is under test and uh, will hopefully be uh, available shortly. Uh, and as we, we talked about this morning, uh, the Transmart COVID-19 uh, project that we're, we're working on to put uh, public data, public genomic data uh, in uh, to an open site, uh, we're using actually Transmart 19. Um, it is an upgrade from version 16.3 and there's a, a relative a straightforward migration path there uh, and the full installation kit uh, for installing uh, 19. Um, quickly in 19, we've done a, a number of things um, that um, we, uh, we're trying to, to push ahead uh, the, the integration. Uh, uh, Transmart, you know, way back at the beginning of its time started as uh, somewhat a derivative product of I2B2 and over the years, uh, the data model, uh, the schema have kind of wandered away and used parts of the I2B2 data model different ways. Uh, and so with this release, we're finally uh, regularizing completely back to have the same data model as I2B2 uh, that we've been describing earlier today. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, and then it, you know, technically we would be able to, to use uh, an I2B2 data set and open it in Transmart, but there's some still work to do to make that actually usable and have a patient view rather than a study view, uh, which so there, there's some more things to do yet, but this takes care of a lot of the internal plumbing, making sure that everything uh, that's th throughout the Transmart is working under the new data model and that, that's all been completed. Um, a number of extensions for the ETL, uh, for loading data and Peter will talk about that a little bit. Uh, updating of the documentation and the help system uh, is, a, is a, a, certainly a big improvement. And you know, as, as we get to the, our, our goal, which is to have an easy transition, if you're working on I2B2 and you wanna move your data set into Transmart to do analysis and all, uh, having a good help system is really important uh, for doing that. Um, and then there's been a lot of, uh, just basically think about as technical debt, things that we needed to do to actually uh, upgrade the, the internals of the system, uh, keep them on supported versions of things like Java and Postgres and you know, move that ahead. And so uh, I ask Peter now to jump in and give us a little more detail and color on some of these things. Are you there, Peter? Yeah. There so you can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds fine. Yeah, lovely. So, yeah, we, as Rudy says, we updated to the ITB2 uh, data model. We've uh, cleaned up things like sizes of all the fields. So everything now matches the size of everything in ITB2. There are some minor things that Transmart has used in the past, and we left them in because ITB2 was considering things like how to handle samples. So we haven't removed that column yet in case ITB2 wants to use it, but Transmart isn't actually using that. Um, dates for would change so that everything that should be a date is now stored as a date. It turns out all the ETLs worked perfectly well out of the box. Um, but what we're not doing yet is actually using those dates for any queries. We'll get around to that in the, the next release. Uh, next slide, Rudy. Thanks. A lot of uh, improvements in the speed of ETLs. Um, RNA-seq platforms spent up to half an hour looking for missing gene IDs. Uh, we now require those to be in the, the field when it's in the file when you load the RNA-seq platforms. It saves a lot of time. Um, we looked at various bottlenecks in the SQL for loading uh, various data types. Found some quite serious ones. So some RNA-seq data loads were taking 24 hours or more. Um, they now run in a few minutes. 
it turns out there was one SQL statement was the bottleneck and by cleaning that up, um, everything went very smoothly. And in fact, the same speed up works for all the data types. Uh, next one, Rudy. Also noticed in uh, tracking down some bugs that um, there were various uh, functions being called in the ETL procedures that could fail and there was no test on their return codes. So they would fail and then the procedure would carry on and you'd find half the data has been loaded. So that's now been fixed. All return codes are checked all the way through and, uh, and acted upon. So we could be much more confident when it says a procedure is finished without an error that it has. Also cleaned, <coughs> cleaned up the job auditing. So there's, there's now also a debug option. It used to be in the past that say a clinical data load could get hung up and you wouldn't know where it has stopped. You can now get it to write the audit messages to your console and see exactly how far it's got. It's usually things like underscores in the data that slow things up. Um, otherwise, when you killed the job, it kill the transactions and you lost the log file, which was not ideal. No. Okay, next. Yeah, we have help. There's been help in Transmart, but the, the main help has always been really old help from Transmart 1.1. Not very, very much of use in various features. Um, there was a manual that was developed as part of um, early versions of 16.1, and that's now updated and we're going to build an updated uh, demo server and use those screenshots. So the screenshots will actually reflect Transmart 19. Some of these are still reflecting earlier versions and may look a little bit strange. We've added help links. There's one circled on that page. In other places, you can get to say the Dataset Explorer help in the manual directly. And the manual pages are all HTML. So if you want to customize them, you can use the the code that generates the manual and put your own local changes in or you can just edit the HTML and put any local extras you need in say local screenshots for example okay we've got a one-off install script for Ubuntu 18.04 we're going to be testing on Ubuntu 20 on CentOS releases and Fedora as well and sort out exactly what's needed for those um, we've updated to Grails 2.5.4. This was done in, by Bert Beckwith in Paul's group as part of their ITP2 Transmart project. It supports Java 8, so we don't use Java 7 anymore. Um, we would love to get on to, to Java 11, but that's something for the future. Um, R has been upgraded to version 4. That's because recently some of the dependencies no longer work in R3.6 3, 3 that we were using. So we've gone to R version 4. Um, Kettle has been upgraded. Various users had noted that it wasn't working for them if they upgraded from, I think, 4.4 we used to use to 4.6. It actually was only a small change needed to fix that, and it works right up to 8.2. And this also allows some extra debugging options to see what's going on in Kettle. So there's a, another option in the scripts that you can just say, give me more detail or give me less detail. We've got a single repository on uh, GitHub, so everything is stored under Transmart. That means when we build a release, all of the artifacts are updated at the same time. Uh, we'll be adding the manual in there once we've updated the images. It's currently in a separate uh, repo. And the legacy interfaces are also covered in there, but we haven't really been looking at those for Transmart 19. Uh, Transmart user interface, the, tran the, the web interface, uh, many, many different versions of uh, things like jQuery under there. They've been replaced by a single version for everything and tested. Uh, we switched to using the asset pipeline to serve all the JavaScript style sheets and images, which is going to be a prerequisite when we upgrade Grails again. Uh, and that's made it more consistent to manage different versions of everything, um, but did involve moving some code around and testing things. Replace the help. It's just installed either under Tomcat or the web server. It still appears at the same URL. We deleted the old help pages. If you want them, go to an old release and, and have a look. And as I say, we'll update the help for the, the new server. Okay, do you want to do the Transmart 20, Rudy, or shall just, I? Uh, just give a couple. Yeah, um, the, the version 20 is not set, right? We're, we're now exploring what features and things that we want to can do and what, what we uh, can realistically get done and when we need it. 
Um, certainly finishing the interoperability with I2B2, um, Peter, Peter will talk about that a bit in a second. Number of new features that we're, we're thinking about um, both uh, things like longitudinal studies, which we've been targeting for a while, uh, and uh, also integration with potentially uh, Arvados uh, for genomic analysis, and then uh, some enhancements to the analysis and, uh, and certainly ETL. Um, but, um, you know, it's like, like uh, you know, at, at this point in the project planning, there, there's a lot of work to do, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a few minutes in terms of a schedule for all of this. So why don't we give a little, little more info here, Peter? Yeah, sure. So um, using the ITB2 tables, as, as um, Jeff was saying, we want to add some documentation on how everything is used so that Transmart understands how the ITB2 tables are used and uh, where we can, for example, use modifiers. Also, how I2B2 would store um, longitudinal data, time-based data, so that we can follow that and implement a model that we can work with in common. So we'd like to be able to open uh, I2B2 clinical data in Transmart and look at it. Uh, it has the issue, two issues. One is that it's not organized as a study, but we could obviously call that the I2B2 study. The other is we want to check that when you've logged into Transmart, you are authorized to look at the I2B2 data. So we need to do some work on common authorization to make that really safely work. Yep. Next one. So longitudinal series, um, there was some work done on this in earlier versions of Transmart. It was based on metadata loaded with, um, with the ETL so that you know that everything is so many days, so many weeks and so on. And some of the analyses would pick that up. But we'd like to clean that up and store things better. Uh, some of the options for studying high dimensional data, there were some extra selection options available in earlier versions of Transmart and we'd like to explore restoring those that we can do as part of the COVID-19 project where we have a lot of issues like that with the data. We'd like to integrate with Arvados. This was partly done with a, um, a, another Transmart development project a couple of years ago. So we'd like to revisit that and see if we can do that properly. Arvados are interested in contributing to that. Uh, adding some new data types, particularly asked for by European users. Uh, we were discussing some of these in the PMC this week. So do join the PMC if you'd like to, to participate in those sort of discussions. Yep. Next, yeah, adding some analysis options. So Fractalis, which was developed as part of ITB2 Transmart, we'd like to work with. It needs some work to sort out um, the API to talk to Fractalis. Uh, adding some more smart R workflows. So the Etrix project actually developed smart R workflows um, to um, reproduce all of the other advanced workflows so we could test those and see if they're safe to use. And any other analysis workflows, particularly with the COVID project, we may look at new analysis options and where to put those. Um, some ETL extensions. So when you load a study, it would be nice if you could also load the data for the browse tab and put basic sample data into the sample explorer and we'd like to put those in as part of the uh, COVID-19 project. So when we share data, you'd have a script that would populate those tabs as well for you. And also we had a, um, a project in the Netherlands that could load a complete study in one step. Basically, it came with a study parameter file and a script that kicked off a cascade of other scripts. And we'd like to revisit that and make that a way to distribute studies as well. Um, Future enhancements, we would love to go to Grails version 4. That's the first version of Grails, which is what Transmart's written in, that would actually support Java 11. Um, the code updates involve moving all the code around into different directories, moving the configuration files, but it would basically look the same as the, the Transmart 17 project, the one that used Arvados and some time series data in the past. So we'd then be able to pick up any other changes from that project that would be useful. Uh, we'd like to upgrade the Postgres database. So Postgres 12 has full support for native partitioning. So we don't need some of the clutches that have been in Transmart all the way through. So we could build an alternative Postgres model that uses native partitioning and test that for performance. Um, I think we could leave the old, old Postgres model in place as well. It's basically the ETL procedures that need to be updated. And also we'd like to add support for SQL Server because ITB2 supports it. And it would also give us a good test of how dependent we are on the DBMS version. Super. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, 
so we don't really have a schedule. You know, there's a lot of work here. Um, not all of it is, is, you know, we don't have funding and, and support for all of this. But generally, you know, we Transmart has been driven by by customer projects and and you know having people in the community interested in particular particular aspects. And certainly, um, you know, the the I two B two integration has was really one of the the, the tenets of the the merger of the I two B two and Transmart Foundation. And so moving that ahead is certainly important. So you know, interoperability with I two B two we think is very important. I th we think that uh, things like, you know, the, the COVID work uh, really is, is, makes it very interesting. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue to evaluate what needs to be done, how to handle studies in, in IQB2 and patient collections and, and Transmar and how we want to do that and try to work through some use cases and all and how that's going to work. And we think that that will be an important um, piece here. Uh, in terms of some of the other capabilities like longitudinal studies in Arvados, uh, we have some uh, use cases that were built previously, we need to validate those and, and work with, you know, uh, users who might be interested in these particular pieces. Um, we're also talking with the the um, the, the group uh, Curie uh, company, which is also now developing Arvados. Um, although you know Arvados is an open platform, of course, uh, but you know working with them in terms of trying to figure out how we want to work that together. And then, of course, have to find, you know, how we want to fund it. And in, in particular sponsors, you know, we really, you know, uh, the Transmart history is not about developing something and trying to find customers, but actually doing things that people are looking for. And so, you know, this whole, this whole piece, you know, all of these things are really about, you know, let's identify the kinds of things that we might want to do. Let's finalize our, our detailed plans about what we actually want to get in uh, and then start to think about what, you know, what the schedule could be and what could be completed, you know, and when. Um, so, you know, whether we do a, you know, a 20.1 that does have some of these things in first and then some of the bigger features or we do wait and do a whole big release here, we're, we're still going to, you know, take the time over the summer into the fall, I'm sure, and, you know, through the PMC, try to make some decisions about how we want to proceed with this. But certainly, you know, to get, you know, this whole list of things in, it's, uh, it's going to be a 2021 release. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll have to be, you know, driven, you know, by the, by the community. So that's kind of our, our look forward. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to, you know, getting on with this now. We think we've got, you know, uh, you know the, the I2B2 integration is really well in hand. And it's a matter of, you know, finalizing and, and finishing what we need to do there. And uh, getting on to some of these bigger, bigger new features is really an important thing for the, for the package. So there's the, the links, these will all be in the, the docu, the, the, the presentation that we uh, release, uh, but there's a lot of information, you know, on the website, on the Transmart Wiki, uh, and um, information on the roadmap. So that's what I have. Uh, I think now we can just open it up in general for questions uh, across uh, all the platforms or, um, you know, what, uh, whatever uh, kind of questions we might have. Oops screen sharing. So let's um, see any questions yet, but uh, open it up. <clears throat> any questions really for anyone um, on any of the platforms? And or anything, actually the whole day, anything that we've talked about during the day, certainly can um, open up the questions. Bill is raising his hand, so let me try to. Okay, yeah, I can't see the hands. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gil. Well, we've had a packed and very full day. I thanks to Diane and Rudy and whole team, everybody. It's really impressive what's come together under the combination of I2B2 and Transmart. And um, there's a lot more to be done. So. Peter, thank you for those advances. David Hanauer, it's really just a lot of uh, valuable developments. And between yesterday's hyper-personalized medicine and today and, and then um, tomorrow, we're really uh, preventing, presenting quite a lot of service to our colleagues all around the world. So Diane, thank you all so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question. Um, do you know anyone who's connecting their data mark to a biorepository? 
So indeed, we've got it uh, connected to our biobank at uh, Partners, and we serve out uh, genomic data based on the, you know, the uh, GWAS that it, it's a um, uh, GWAS data that gets processed in about a quarter of the sample. So we have about um, 20,000 uh, genomes that are hosted in the I2B2 database. And then we have about 100, actually maybe a, we have about 30,000 now. And then we have about 120 samples, 120,000 <laughs> samples that are linked into it. And what they can do is that they can um, query the biobank portal is what we call it for uh, uh, patients who you know, have any kind of healthcare data, who have specific kinds of variants um, and who have consents. There's different kinds of consents that we have, so you can query by consent as well. And then we also have a red cap survey that many of the participants filled out. Um, you know, things that you wouldn't find in the medical record, you know, alcohol use, where it's inhaled and so forth. And then um, you can actually use that, uh, uh, because they're all consented, um, we can pull a limited data set from, from directly from the portal. So we don't have to um, uh, go through the IRB even. We can use this as a, a click-through data use agreement. And using that um, uh, uh, table creation um, software that Jeff showed you in the, uh, what, what's coming in 13 actually, um, one can specify the fields, the, you know, the columns that one wants uh, with, you know, a certain kind of diagnosis or maximum of a certain lab value for the patient or the average of a lab value for a patient, all in a one subject per row table that you can then get directly from the, the, the portal. And um, we have about a thousand users of the portal and they pulled somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 data sets um, over the past six years ago, five years, I guess it's been, five or six years. Yes, so I have another example for you. Am I there? Yep. Hello. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's Gil. Yeah, yeah another go good example is University of Michigan. Many of you know Becky Steck and Matthias Kretzler. They have uh, multiple multinational um, private partner, private public partnerships on kidney diseases, big users of uh, Transmart. And um, the Michigan, University of Michigan, a biobank has at least 50,000 patients now. Wow. And uh, they have many uh, users from other places too. So I think it's a, another good example. Great, thanks, thanks Gil. There was a follow-up, Sean, for you. Um, do you have an ontology in I2B2 that will allow researchers to query for patient lists, including those with specimens in the biorepository? Sorry, Rudy, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, sorry. Do you have an ontology in I2B2 that will allow researchers to query for patient lists, including those with specimens in the biorepository? So we, we, the ontology that we have uh, is um, really what we, what, we, what we publish already for healthcare. So that's pretty much what we've got. We have the, that ACT ontology that we have in the, um, that we release as part of I2B2 currently. Um, it's largely, it's very, or it's very, very similar to that, if not exactly that. And then, but we also include the red cap uh, transformation of those questions. So those are very specific to the red cap uh, 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 form that we have our folks fill out. Um, but that has all the questions in that ontology. And then it's a, it's a small consent ontology. I think it has, um, have they been consented and uh, are they, did they agree to be recontacted? Um, get, uh, and then, um, in the genomic data, it has, um, that part is actually a plugin. So you can get all of that uh, in, uh, if you go to the I2B2 community website, you'll see there's a, there's a genomic uh, uh, software release there. 
And that embodies essentially the uh, query that we have to uh, specify the variance. And the way that that's done is that it looks just like a lab in some way. So you pull over, it says um, uh, gene, for example, and it has, uh, and so then, so then you pull over the gene, the, this, this ontology item that asks, it says, you know, you want to query by a gene, and then it will pop up all the different genes that exist in the, um, uh, in, on the GWAS, and then you can pick one of them. It's right stem, it doesn't, it's not a drop down, it's like a right stem. And then you will, um, then you say, okay, and just like a lab, it'll say gene equals, you know, um, something, and then, it, uh, and then it will um, query for every patient that has that uh, uh, gene in the database. And then you can also specify things like, you know, do you want it to be um, uh, protein altering? Do you want the, there to be a variant on the gene that's protein altering or, um, you know, different kinds of ways that the uh, structure of the DNA might be affected. This, this is Diane. I just wanted to throw something out to the community. So over the past um, at least three years, the community has really, really um, asked us to put together roadmaps so people understand kind of where we're going. Um, I just, I don't know if anybody wants to comment about how you think we've done, you know, what, do you think we're going in the right direction? Is this the roadmap that you um, believe um, it will take us to the future. Just any comments about that? People were very vocal before, so either we're doing a really, really good job and everybody's happy, or at the end of the day, people are tired, but let us know what you think. Hi, Dan. I think one of the, the advantages now is we have a roadmap, but thanks to Dell, we have the funding as well, so we kind of had a car to go with it. So we can actually make some, make some more progress ourselves without being dependent on community contributions for everything. <laughs> Justin Lancaster says, uh, doing a great job, but he's tired. Lots of info presented today, but thank you. Appreciate that, Justin. Yeah, he's very excited about everything that moves towards public access. And sensor data in I2B2? Which, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, is, is, the question was, will I2B2 integrate sensor-based data, uh, yeah. and how do you solve the common data elements issue? And I actually don't have an answer for this. It sounds like a... a I mean, the beautiful thing about I2B2 is you can put lots of stuff in it, and I can't, don't see why you couldn't put sensor data in there, but I don't know that of anyone that's done it. Um, so I'll toss it to Sean and everyone else, because maybe maybe there's someone out there that we know about. Yeah, so sensor data in that um, uh, it would be downloaded from a government site, I would assume, that where a official sensor uh, uh, geocoded data would exist is that I, I think that's is that the what they what, what people would be interested in I was wondering if it was like like monitor data like heart that's what monitors. I thought oh I see oh yeah. oh that's I see for some reason I I yeah. just oh. dumb. thinking of the social yeah, distance. you guys are right yeah. um yeah so um that, that, that's a very good, we, we currently, I mean, you can imagine how it could happen. We, we've been putting a lot of effort into getting just plain old EKGs in, I have to say. Um, not really anything fancy, more just, you know, just getting a whole, like, many millions of EKGs in so we can um, analyze their waveforms, um, you know, um, that exist from, from, from our MUSE system. Um, especially for certain kinds of, um, you know, uh, drug uh, uh, exposures and so forth. We found, you know, in QTC interval changes and um, arrhythmias that can happen. And I should say that the, the, the recent hydroxychloroquine um, uh, uh, data, which, uh, you know, made it very interesting to, to gather some of this together. We, we haven't, the way that you would do it is that you would take a continuous feed and then you would, uh, trigger, or you would look for certain events that are occurring, and those events would become facts in I2B2. So you wouldn't want to put the whole stream of data into I2B2. It's possible, but that would be, I'm not quite sure how you would even use it, right? It could fit in the fact table, but I'm not sure how you could even use it. It's kind of, if you want to think of it, it's almost the wrong dimension, right? 
So the 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 data in I2B2 is usually an observation, like a specific observation, and um, and 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 the and and the data that you get off a sensor device is something that's kind of a continuous, maybe once every 60th, 60th of a second, which um, it would be difficult to kind of query with the other data that's in I2B2. But what you can do is you can have a separate repository for that. And then you can, with machine learning, figure out or, or forget machine learning, just in any kind of algorithm detection, find like when somebody has an arrhythmia, for example. And then what you would trigger that, 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 that trigger for an arrhythmia would become a fact. And that fact would go into the fact table. So when the fact table would say, you know, Sunday at 5.06 p.m., there was an arrhythmia detected. And then Monday at uh, 2 a.m., there was another arrhythmia detected. And each of those, those would be two facts in the database. And then you could go in and query I2B2 and say, okay, did the person have an arrhythmia? At, or who had an arrhythmia and was on hydroxychloroquine? And then you would get the right number of patients and you can, you know, output the data and look at those patients uh, carefully. But um, but uh, you would probably want to digest the, the whole sensor uh, streaming data into a number of discrete facts. I'd like to uh, unmute Russ. He had a, a comment in the uh, chat box. So I'll unmute him and he can he can talk. I think for us, our next one of our next areas we're actively working on is standardizing the ontology for sharing notes. Um, don't know if that's been discussed lately in terms of um, working on standardized notes ontology for ACT or for other purposes. So that's a really good question, Russ. How would you go about that? I mean, are you talking about note types? Yeah, there's a there's a link note type ontology, but I haven't seen it widely adopted. It has kind of five dimensions. I think if you try to do all five dimensions, they may not be typically encoded in an Epic EMR that way. So you have to reference other items to drill down to what provider made the note. But getting us beyond kind of, yes, you can load them in I2B2 to where we're actually positioned to know I'm searching a, h and by cardiology or, you know, an h and by a physician, I think would help us uh, integrate free text data more uh, generalizable for the community. Right. I mean, yeah. You could, it would really depend a lot, I would think, on whether the source system had that metadata available for each note that map to the ontology because even if you had five levels of the ontology you could just make some kind of hierarchy out of it even if it had to repeat a bit right so if it was like you know uh h and p and then the area you could arrange it that way or if you, or you could do area and then you know under each one of those h and p or and all the different note types that come from the area so you could kind of you, you could you could arrange your your um ontology in such a way that it would make sense to your, your, your researcher. The, the problem would be, if there was a problem, it would be, does the notes that come in have that metadata tag on it that allows you to easily, you know, uh, do that mapping? Because if you didn't, I could see that it would be hard. You'd have to use like the title of the note or where it came from or something like that. I think, you know, from what we're seeing is you can get in the ballpark and then you may reference other data about this was authored, who was the author of the note and then reference back to the provider table to figure out who they were. But I think for what we're seeing with our I2B2 where we pull data out and then as we look in the Greater Plains Collaborative to be able to tell potential investigators using us, yes, you can do a study and we have all the pathology reports. So we know their pathology reports and they're encoded with a standard or you want cardiovascular, different types of notes, or you want the ED triage notes. If we could get that done, then in addition to kind of using I2B2 as an interface and as an, you know, a tool, the people want the notes. They actually, while we could NLP everything, actually just being able to tell people, here you go, I can ship you these notes um, as we've also done the de-identification, it would go a long way towards 
helping people do more rigorous text analytics, which is uh, kind of an area we're pointed at for the CTSA group. So, you know, Russ, I think it's not too bad to get that first level of, you know, are you a pathology node? Are you a radiology node? Are you an uh, uh, H and P, you know, that, that first level. And if that's useful, that, um, I mean, I think all Epic sites probably have an ontology for that in that, you know, share an ontology for that. Um, Cause I'm, I'm assuming that it would, it would probably be similar. Do you think that would be helpful? Well, I think we'll work on it. It'll be interesting to see, you know, because everybody, you load them typically based upon what's locally in Epic, but then you have a lot of oddities. So it's, it's similar to how over the years we've now standardized meds and we've standardized labs. Whereas if you'd come to the conference 10 years ago, I don't think that was commonly done where now we're there. So I think our ability to go after the free text notes um, is kind of a next area where if we agreed upon like the LOINC hierarchy, just like ACT has pushed us to agree upon certain things, um, it's not glamorous which way you go and we have a straw man, but I think if we get ours implemented, it'd be good to know among N2C2 and among this group, you know, are we moving towards adopting a standardized notes ontology? And then that way, you know, if you guys deployed some advanced analytics that we're doing in LP, you'd know for sure I can now deploy this code across multiple I2B2 sites and it will do its NLP on the right substrate. It won't be applying it to the wrong type of node. I would second this. This is Matvey. I, I think it's a great idea. We, we come across nodes where we extract facts for diabetes, for example, and then it turns out that they are instructions on how to take care of diabetes and they may have nothing to do with the patient. So uh, some kind of a node typing ontology would be fantastic. I just don't know how easy it would be to map existing nodes and various vendor systems to an ontology. The, the, the Loink one, the Loink one is probably 20 years old by now. Yeah, and it's not very specific, but it's better, it's a good starting spot. So yeah, I guess um, if people are interested, it'd be good to know if a subset of sites may be interested in that, we could, that would give Noor uh, Abu al Rub on our team, a uh, colleague to bounce ideas off of from another site. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree completely. Um, I'm just trying to think of how, how would one get started here? Um, we could easily just put our notes ontology. I mean, we could we could put it like like uh, like the Pittsburgh team did with their COVID ontology. We could put it in the demo ontology. Just to, I, I'm just trying to how 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 would you think what what do you think would be the best way to get started, Russ? Well, I think you know we had a site Babel where we put up our ontology. So just knowing people what they have for notes ontology, and then if we uh, just knew who was there and then maybe one or two driving use cases, you know, would be one way to do it. It could be grounded in COVID while there's interest. So where we were looking for symptoms um, for COVID, you could say, okay, do that. But now instead of just saying you found them in general on the patients, you'd be able to say this was found in the context of this type of note, this was found in an ED note, you know, and so forth. But just to understand, so you have a notes ontology already. Yes, and it has basically the notes authored in Epic, and then it has notes like pathology and radiology impressions and radiology um, findings that are in a order results notes ontology. Okay. But it's totally our creation. It's basically there are notes, and our notes ontology has three components. It has the note concepts that you can extract out of Epic, which are structured, that we would like to map to using SNOMED. Then we have a notes ontology of about what, probably 120 items that are kind of our local Epic installs note names. Um, and some of them you can say are probably consistent across a lot of Epic sites and other ones may be very ad hoc to Kansas and need to be mapped. And then as we've started tackling order results coming in that are radiology and pathology, they're in another note part of the ontology. It's, it's a very simple flat ontology. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to standardize it so that if I was making a request of GPC or of ACT and I wanted to do NLP on path notes, we'd all, it's simple. We just know, aha, this is what it is. It's coded with the right, right link term. Or if people wanted to see operative reports, 
done by urology from a urology you know, a case, or they wanted to see an H&P from a cardiologist, we'd be able to say, here you go, those are the notes. Instead of right now, we have this uh, interoperability problem where you can't be more specific on what notes you wanna look at for a patient from Kansas to uh, Mass General. Do you have a demo I2B2, um, Russ? We don't have like a little sub demo. We do have a test instance. Yeah, so probably Dan and Nor and Love could show you what we've got, or we could do a demo sometime on live, de identified data to just show people what this looks like. You know, it would be great to get together with the, with the Pittsburgh team too. Um, because I think they, they're curating the ACT ontology right mm -hmm. now. So that would be um, a way that, um, you know, we could just get started. Yeah. And then if you, you know, if you, if you put it on a little demo one, we could, you know, send it out generally to the I2B2 community. They can all, people can look at it that way. It's really easy. Uh, maybe even make it so that the ontology is in a, 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 a GitHub and, or, you know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but just, just, you know, just like, you know, putting it in a, in a little demo uh, uh, I2B2 and, 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 and publishing that a bit could, could, could really start things. Yeah, and I think, I think it's on the, what we have today is on our GitHub, but with uh, the problems with Epic, it's probably not widely open yet. Just don't want to take up the whole meeting, but that was one thing kind of that's been yeah. front of our mind for us a little bit. Yeah, it's a neat idea. Yeah, you know, and it ties into, because I've been, I'm not a NLP person at all. I'm there to learn, but I've been part of the uh, text analytics and NLP working group, which for the CTSA has been thinking about how do we make both just the substrate of data available, as well as how do people begin to get to the point where they can benchmark NLP algorithms on the NCATS cloud. And so one fundamental obstacle is, well, you got to agree upon, are we looking, are we talking about the same note? So it's not a it's not a giant problem. I think we just it'd be good to get consensus, like you say, with the ACT network. Yeah, yeah. No, it seems tractable. Any other questions, thoughts? Anybody else want to say something? This, I mean, we're we're running up to the end of the day, but we want to cut it off. Can I just ask one? Uh, I noticed, um, David, do you, do you have a solution to this problem? Sorry, are you asking me at Michigan? Yes, I am. Uh, no, it's, it's an absolute mess. And it's, um, it's really difficult because it's not just the notes. It's actually notes. It's test types, radiology types, uh, radiology order types, radiology report types. It goes on and on. Um, and then we actually have data from other systems as well. So um, the answer that we have so far is that we just pull in the names and uh, just provide them as metadata for people. At some point, we do hope to allow people to do some more filtering, in which case we will have to do some sort of mapping uh, to make it somewhat reasonable for people. And, and uh, I don't have a good answer to that because it's, it's the number of different unique note types is in the hundreds, if not thousands, because everybody makes their own note type. And that's, that's right. what gets challenging. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just, since we're on that topic and we're stuck on, um, the basic results off of orders, the interesting thing about that would be you could tie back to the parent orderable. So you could say, aha, this is a 3D echo order that then has resulted in the, the resulting report for the Doppler or it's a radiology impression from a CT of the abdomen. So where it's derived from an order that was authored within the system, you're probably not too bad. Now, if it was a send out and then it's blowing back in over an HL7 interface, you may be in trouble. Now, in terms of note notes authored in Epic, like a progress note, our choices in our instance are not great. 
but they're not horrible. You know, there's like, it's less than probably 300 terms. So I think it's a, it's a manageable thing to deal with like 300 items. Um, and just knowing it's radiology versus pathology is the starting spot, but you could do work potentially to um, take the orderables, which is another area we're probably deficient on standardizing. You know, we, we focus a lot on standardizing procedures and the bill of the, for the procedure, but the physician order itself, sometimes I don't think we've done as much to encode the physician orderables, especially things like nursing orders. Uh, but, you know, you could, for some of these reports, tie them back to what was the thing that was ordered that generated the radiology report, which then generated a specific CPT code. And so there you could probably come up with something that would be manageable possibly. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of options available. We, we just have not gone down the path of trying to figure out how it could be solved at this point. Yeah, so I think if we just start with just an example maybe, Russ, um, that would be great. So would you take this to the ACT technology working group or them first perhaps? So, you know, the problem is ACT I don't think is that interested in notes right now. Um, it should be, and I hope it will be, but it's not right at this moment. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is a really important uh, from a number of reasons that Dave, David already pointed out in terms of like being able to steer chart reviews and so forth. Um, so, um, so I think, so I just got an email from Michelle Morris who says that, um, who says that if you want to put it on the test server, um, she can load it for you. So what would that mean, uh, Michelle? I guess, uh, okay, so we need to, we, we should arrange. So basically, Russ, what that means is that if we can, if we can get your sample, we could probably put it on the ACT server as a, as a, as a potential um, part of the ontology. Yeah, well, we, we can probably share our ugly current version and then Sounds great. on the new version, say here's a first pass sketch of how we get to the first version and then here's the pointer to the code on GitHub. Yeah. So thanks for letting me bring it up. Okay, any other, any other comments? Last minute thoughts from folks? No? Okay. Well, um, it's, been a, it's been a really fantastic day. Uh, it's been a long day. So and if anybody is left from Europe, I think Peter, Peter is on. I think it's midnight his time. Thank you, Peter, for hanging in there. Um, oh, it's only 11 o'clock. I'm in the UK. <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. Well, only 11 o'clock. All right. Well, I just, I wanted to really thank all of our um, speakers today. I think, you know, uh, every single uh, presentation was, was really top notch and, and I, and I appreciate it. I also want to uh, thank all the participants and the, the people that, that came. And we still have, at this time, we still have 65 people. It's gone down. 65 people left. Um, so a lot of people stuck it uh, through. Um, we will be starting tomorrow um, at 8.30. And again, we've got the reports from the different working groups, um, which I think are extremely interested. So please um, join for that. And then the second half of the day is to cover, uh, take a deeper dive into the, um, the app network. So um, with that, um, unless anybody has any last minute comments, I will say um, good night. All right, then. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.